Hello, I'm Lisa Mott, Teaching Associate at the University of Nottingham. Welcome to this masterclass from Satellite Navigation to Quantum Black Holes from Dr. Yorma Luko, Associate Professor in the School of Mathematical Sciences here at the University of Nottingham. If you have any questions during this talk, then you may ask them anonymously by clicking on the speech bubble with a question mark that you will probably see at the top right of the screen. We have two student ambassadors today, Agnes and Max, and our Director of Undergraduate Recruitment, Professor Matthew Hubbard, who will all answer some of your questions today. I will now hand over to Dr. Yorma Luko. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's Mathematics Masterclass. The topic is uh, wide ranging from satellite navigation to uh, quantum black holes. And these are all topics that are close to uh, my heart. So I am a mathematical physicist. Um, here is a snapshot of me at an animated moment in a uh, lecture. And so on my research side, I work with space and time and space time and so on. Uh, here's an example of what I've been teaching recently, including black holes for the fourth year students. I'll put up in a moment uh, the agenda for the next uh, 20 something minutes. Uh, but before that, let's start off with a quick quiz. Here are pictures of three scientists. I've named them scientist Alpha, Beta and Gamma. And these pictures are 150 to 100 years old. And that explains the lack of diversity in this gallery. OK, but the point for today uh, is all of these scientists did something that we use every day. Okay? Each of them did something like that. And I'd like to ask, can you identify which two of these three did something that is essential for SatNav, Google Maps or similar to work? Was it scientist Alpha and Beta? Was it scientist Beta and Gamma? Or scientist Alpha and Gamma, which pair was it? and you have an opportunity to do a poll. Here's the URL, here's the uh, QR code. I will now shut up for about one minute and then I'll see what you've done in the poll. OK, I can see a few responses. 30 seconds to go. OK, let's call that a poll and the poll says option C is about 50% answers and options A and B the remaining 25% each. So did the majority get it right this time? So who are these people? So on the left, there's somebody called James Clark Maxwell, a Scotsman. OK, and what he did, he wrote down equations that radio waves obey. Radio waves is something that certainly we use every day. Yeah, scientist Beta, uh, well, th there's a big hint in the picture. OK, this is the guy who discovered X-rays. His name was Röntgen and right, X-rays, that's something we use every day. Well, maybe not you and me personally, but you know what I mean. And then the scientist Gamma, and uh, no crisis here. I mean, one of the most recognizable faces in science and beyond. This is, of course, Albert Einstein, and he is best known for his theories of relativity. And which two of these is it that we use in SatNav? Well, the majority got it right. It is scientist Alpha and scientist Gamma. We use 
uh, radio waves and we use relativity in set nav and that those two pieces are uh, those two things are an essential part of it so congratulations if you got it right okay. So what we want to cover is, broadly speaking, things that Einstein explains. And we'll start with the set nav, the global uh, positioning system. Then we'll venture further out to the sky and we'll take a look at black holes. Uh, still uh, out to the sky, we'll look at gravitational waves. Uh, and if uh, time permits, uh, we may say a few things about things that Einstein no longer explains and where ongoing research is going on as a work for the future. So let's start with uh, set nav global positioning. I'd like to show one overhead cartoon of how set nav works. And this is slightly non-trivial because uh, I am reminded that a few years ago, Stephen Fry, when he was the host of QI on, um, on, on BBC, he tried to explain how set nav works and he got the basic idea backwards. Eh? So it's not entirely trivial. Let's take one overhead to take a look at it. So uh, here's the Earth. Um, apologies for the quality of the artwork. OK, but here's the Earth. And here is a satellite that orbits the Earth on a carefully known orbit. With the SatNav system, there are 24 of these satellites, each on a carefully known orbit, and each satellite has a precise atomic clock and a radio sender that sends the time signal of this clock. So what happens is here's you, and you can maybe if you look very carefully, you can may even see um, a cell phone in the hand there, okay? So that cell phone, if that cell phone sees at the same time four satellites, it gets those four time signals. Those time signals don't come simultaneously. They come with a delay depending how far the satellite is. The radio signal, after all, uh, goes with the speed of light. So if there are those four satellites on the sky visible at the same time, your cell phone knows how to calculate from those four signals and their time delays where you are and the exact time where you are. OK, so that's the basic idea. And when you look at it, uh, this doesn't look particularly impressive. I mean, if we spent an afternoon with you uh, revising certain things about trigonometry, uh, maybe three dimensional trigonometry, maybe some aspect of mechanics, you could do this calculation based on this picture. The Greeks could have done this calculation 2000 years ago. And we'd get the answer wrong. We'd get the answer wrong because we need Einstein to get the answer right. Where do we need Einstein? Well, Einstein tells you that the time up there in the satellites, it's not quite the same thing as the time that we measure down here in the gravitational well of the Earth. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with the clocks in the satellites. They, they work perfectly fine. It's just that this very notion of time up there is different than the notion of time down here. And there are, in fact, two uh, effects at work here. One has to do with the velocity of the satellites with respect to us. The other has to do with the height of the satellites uh, with respect to us. And you can put numbers to both of these effects and uh, you can do the calculation. And the bottom line is, if you didn't know about Einstein's theory, you'd get a wrong answer by about 38 microseconds per day for how the satellite uh, clocks run. Now, 38 microseconds per day, that, that doesn't sound very much, OK? But remember, those time delays get converted to distances by the speed of light. And in one microsecond, light goes 300 meters. If you look at these numbers, if you want to maintain 10 meter accuracy, if you didn't know about Einstein, you'd lose that 10 meter accuracy within about two minutes. To keep Satnav running for more than two minutes, you need Einstein. And that is the first take home message of today, um, especially if you are at home already. Einstein's theory 
is part of everyday science. It's something that we use every day. Einstein's theory saves lives. Next topic, um, I promise to say something about black holes. Okay, now nowadays black hole is something that we have in common speech I and mean, something disappears into a black hole, we say, and it's, it goes and it never comes back. Uh, we've known about these black holes for about 100 years now, and for the first 50 years, this was not so clear. But what are there black holes there at all? There was some mathematical understanding that there's something from which not even light can escape and so on. But for the first 50 years of this idea, there was a big question, do black holes exist in the sky? This has not been a big question for several decades by now. Uh, one place where we know there are black holes are at the centers of galaxies, centers of most, possibly every galaxy. Here's an example of what we see. There's a distant galaxy, okay, it has a certain name, and there's a black hole at the center of it. Now, we don't see the black hole itself, but we see some radiation that comes out when matter falls into a black hole. Some of it goes down, but some just barely escapes and comes out, is ejected, and that's what we see as the outcome. Okay? We've known about these for some uh, decades, and uh, there are even better pictures come, that have come out in the last three or four years, but uh, the, um, I don't have a good picture of that here. So most, possibly all galaxies have a black hole at their center. They are humongous. This is 10 to 9 solar masses, so two or 2 billion solar masses. Our own galaxy, the Milky Way, our own galaxy is not an exception. Uh, we uh, live in a respectable neighborhood, cosmologically speaking, right? So there's a black hole at the center of our own galaxy. And here is a picture, a photo taken in infrared of stars near the center of our own galaxy. And there's a black hole. Now you can't see it, of course, but what you can see is these stars around the center, and we've been able to follow how these stars orbit the center for the past 20 years or so. There are nice, uh, f uh, nice um, uh, films about this. Uh, I put here down a web address where you can see uh, see a video clip. This uh, this um, uh, uh, this uh, URLs will become later, so you don't you can go and check out the video then. I can't show the video here, but what I can show is a sketch of the orbits. So we've, been, we've seen those stars go around the orbits. Some of them have completed a full orbit already over the past 20 years. And from this, we know that at the center, there is something that keeps these uh, stars on their orbit. We can calculate the mass. It's about 4 million solar masses. Okay, it's in a very small part of space. There's nothing else that we know of that could fit in such a small place and have four solar, uh, have four million solar masses. There is a black hole at the center of our galaxy. Uh, and that is the uh, second uh, message of today. Black holes are out there. They are commonplace astrophysical objects. The third topic uh, that I wanted to talk about is gravitational waves. So it's another prediction of those equations that Einstein wrote down uh, about 100 years ago. So uh, what are these things? Uh, let's uh, compare them with something more familiar. Let's compare them to radio waves. Now radio waves, this is something for which Maxwell wrote down uh, the equations and the this is really something we know about. Every time you use your cell phone, you are using radio waves to communicate between your cell phone and the cell phone tower. Uh, right, and we know how that works. Uh, so radio waves, they are born when charge moves. So you wiggle the electrons in the antenna of your cell phone, and that sends a radio wave to the cell phone tower. Okay, and somebody hears you speaking. Conversely, if somebody wants to talk to you, the cell phone tower sends a radio wave to your cell phone, and the antenna, ah, oh, it senses, and the, the electrons, they start wiggling, and you hear what your mum is saying. 
and these radio waves, they carry energy, you have to charge your cell phone once in a while. Okay, so th this is something that we have everyday hands-on experience about. Now, Einstein said that gravitational waves exist and they work very much the same way. What's wiggling now is not charge, but it is mass. You generate gravitational waves by moving mass. When they go through you, they cause small distant changes and they do carry energy. How much? Okay, what do you need to do to create a gravitational wave? Um, let me do a hands-on example. <clears throat> I will now generate a gravitational wave. There. I wiggled masses okay, that generated a gravitational wave that went right into the ether through the computer screens, through the walls of the house, and the uh, computer screen and the walls of the house, they, they didn't care very much. If you put numbers to this, the power with which I generated by fist waving in gravitational waves, it's a small number. If you express it in watts, there's zero point and then about 50 zeros and then something over there. And the, when the wave went through the computer screen, it caused minute changes in the distances between the two ends of the computer screen. But these are way, way, way smaller than individual atomic nuclei, totally unobservable with my feeble efforts here to, to, uh, to, to uh, make gravitational waves count. You need something uh, heavier, you need something uh, sturdier to generate gravitational waves. And I've got a second quiz of this talk coming here in a few moments. So I'm thinking now at the solar, of the solar system and I'm thinking, what's the uh, <clears throat> heaviest wiggling object that we have available in the solar system? And you know, of course, what it is. It is the Jupiter, or more technically speaking, the Sun-Jupiter pair. When Jupiter goes around the Sun once every five years or so, uh, no, I can't remember the number, but when Jupiter goes around the uh, Sun, uh, Jupiter, this pair generates gravitational waves. By what power? That power turns out to be a human scale number, and I'd like you to take a guess. The power by which this system sends gravital, uh, gravitational waves, do you think it's like the power of a classroom laser pointer, one milliwatt or so? Do you think it might be about the power of a low energy light bulb? Or do you think it might be about the power of an industrial laser? I mean, you know, one of those things that goes right through steel. Which of those three do you think it is? Here's a poll. I'll stop speaking for one minute. Okay, so far I can see that about half of the responses are for B, and the rest are kind of scattered. Still about 15 seconds to go. Okay, let's close the poll. And the results are, it's an even vote between B and A, each of them about 40%, and the rest then for uh, choice C. Okay, now I would not know this without doing a calculation, so this is an unfair thing to ask you to guess, uh, but this is an example of a case where the majority uh, did not get it right. 
Okay. The right answer is, in fact, C. The Sun-Jupiter pair, it sends out gravitational waves with a power that's about an industrial laser. So does Jupiter care about this very much? Not really. I mean, you, you, sh you shine an, in, uh, an industrial laser into Jupiter and Jupiter doesn't care. The orbital motion of the Jupiter doesn't notice it at all. So uh, it's difficult to send gravitational waves. Even Jupiter can't do it in a way that, that would be very noticeable. We need to go still further out uh, to the sky to see systems that do generate gravitational waves in a noticeable way. There's one such system about which we've known since the 1970s, okay? And it's a certain double star system. And here's a cartoon of what it looks like. There are two stars, they are orbiting each other. And there's the center of gravity, if you like. They're highly elliptical orbits and they orbit each other. We see one of these stars, it's a neutron star and it's got a magnetic field of its own. And it sends radio waves that we can monitor quite closely and that's how we know there is this object and we can follow how the orbit uh, uh, works. And this system, I mean these are neutron stars, so uh, this system sends out gravitational waves, says Einstein. That energy carried out by the gravitational waves, it needs to come from somewhere and it comes from the orbital motion of these stars. They get gradually um, uh, closer to each other. The orbital period gets shorter and shorter. Here is 30 years of observations of that orbital period. Okay? The dots are observations of how the orbital period changes. The solid line is the prediction of Einstein's general relativity. Now would be a good moment to be impressed by Einstein's theory of general relativity. Those dots are on the line. Okay? This is Nobel Prize uh, research, uh, highly accurate. So uh, Einstein's theory the gravitational wave prediction was recognized um, about 20 years ago, 30, almost 30 years ago by now, by this, and it was Nobel Prize research. So this is a gravitational wave system about which we've known for a few decades now. For the past five years, we've been able to say, ah, we've got really first-hand observations. And this is something we've seen in laboratories built here on Earth. The best known one of them is something called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And how they work would be uh, a a masterclass in its own right. Here's a picture of one of those laboratories. There's a laser beam that goes three kilometers uh, along uh, the prairie, uh, along the American prairie in a vacuum tube. There's another vacuum tube and another laser beam that goes to the left. And with those laser beams, you can carefully, you can accurately measure these small changes in distance that gravitational waves induce. And the first observation with this system was in 2015, and by now we've got lots of them, okay? And two weeks ago in the news, there was a recent observation where we saw a merger of a black hole and a neutron star. Most of these observations we've seen have come from mergers of black holes. There are a few that have come from mergers of neutron stars, but two weeks ago in the news, we saw we had a confirmed sighting by this uh, gear uh, of a merger of a gravitational, of a, a black hole and a neutron star. So this is now a tool. Gravitational waves are now a tool for learning about our universe. We've seen these black hole mergers, neutron star mergers. We didn't know that that sort of, that quite that sort of black holes existed there. We knew about the supermassive black holes, okay. But 30 solar mass black holes, we didn't really know about that until we saw them with this gear. Einstein's theory, and here the prediction of gravitational waves, it has become a window with which we can look out in the sky, learn out things about our own universe that we didn't know about by other means. So far, these observatories are here on Earth. 
there are plans to put some in sky and here's an artistic impression of something that might fly in the next 10, maybe 20 years, okay? So uh, the third take home message is Einstein's theory and specifically gravitational waves here, they are tools for finding out about our universe. They are a tool of finding out things that we wouldn't know otherwise. And that's the uh, third uh, take home message uh, for today. I think I have uh, still a few moments. OK, so here we've been talking about things that uh, Einstein explains, how Einstein tells us how we find out uh, things about our own uh, universe. Science did not stop at Einstein. Einstein doesn't explain everything. And uh, I'd like to end here with one thing that Einstein doesn't explain. What happens inside a black hole? Suppose you jump in a black hole, what happens to you? Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that you actually do this. Okay? It's a one way trip. Uh, but suppose somebody sends, uh, somebody does fall in a black hole, what happens to them? Well, Einstein theory predicts that you fall in a black hole, you encounter something called a singularity by a finite amount of time by your very own watch. Uh, what that means in everyday terms is that by a finite amount of time by your own watch, you uh, discover a place where you have infinite temperature, you have infinite de density, you have infinite pressure, all by a finite amount of time by your own watch. When was the last time you saw an infinite temperature? Uh, right, me neither, as my American father-in-law used to say. Um, if your physical theory, in this case Einstein's theory, tells you that within a finite amount of time you are going to encounter infinite pressure, infinite density, infinite temperature, then it's time to think that no, you, you're really trying to use your theory beyond its domain of, val of validity. Einstein has explained a lot, but here's something that Einstein doesn't explain. We need to go beyond Einstein. We need to go beyond Einstein's theory of gravity, Einstein's general relativity. What is that something? Well, we don't quite know. There is a big consensus that it should be somehow a combination of gravity and the quantum. But at present, we don't know what those fundamental building blocks of quantum space and time are. It's an ongoing research area. You may have heard some key words that go with this. There are active research directions being pursued in that direction, but that would be a topic for another talk. Uh, as my final uh, picture, I will just flash an idea. Here is an artistic impression what the horizon of a quantum black hole might look like in one of these research ideas that are currently being uh, pursued uh, for uh, uh, to, to resolve these, um, well, to explain what is happening inside a black hole. This is an artistic impression. Is this the correct picture? We don't know. That's an open research problem. But maybe in 30 years time, one of you uh, will be giving a Nottingham Maths Masterclass talk and I can come from my retirement home and listen to your talk and see, ah, was this the correct idea for a quantum black hole or not? And I believe we are coming to the end of time. So let me just uh, mention that there are good web resources where to learn about things. I've got here a few links and these links will uh, be available uh, later on. And questions are welcome. We are shortly coming to the question period. But before we go to the question period, I would like to mention that it is possible to study these things in a maths degree uh, in Nottingham. So how might that work? Well, if you're in year one, you've got a fixed program and it, it includes some relevant things. 
from year two on, you, if you want to study these things, you want to uh, start specializing into mathematical physics and suitable method types modules. In year three, you see, ah, relativity, Einstein's theory, that's where it is, okay, and other related modules. And in year four, we have, yes, black holes, that's what we're, there we are, where we are really getting uh, to grips with these things. And uh, I believe uh, that is the end of the science thing that I have here. I would like to mention, I'd, I'd like to finish by mentioning a few uh, links. So uh, before you, uh, if you decide to apply to Nottingham, okay, so uh, there is information about the structure of our courses. Uh, there are open day math talk videos that tell about how our courses work and, and such things. And we do have some taste lectures and popular math talks available that we've recently uh, uh, included, right? So on various areas of mathematics, uh, including mathematics in this highly uh, topic area of epidemiolo epidemiology over here. And here's a link. And I believe I should stop here and uh, hand over to the host of this afternoon. We will now start the question and answer part of today's session. If you have any more questions, please post them in the Q&A chat at the top right of your screen. Um, Agnes, Max and Matthew, would you like to introduce yourselves, please? So we're first going to hand over to Agnes. Hello, I'm Agnes. I'm on a single honours um, M math course. Um, I've just finished my second year and I'm going towards specialising in statistics. Max? Good afternoon, I'm Max. I've just finished my third year uh, and final year at Nottingham and um, I'm going on to do mastery things soon. And uh, to Matthew, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm Matthew. Um, as Lisa said at the start, I'm Director of Undergraduate Recruitment, which means that I'm responsible for recruiting to the degree programmes we have. And I'm here just in case there are general questions about the degree programmes, but happily it looks as though there are lots and lots of technical questions to be asked before there's anything like that. So back to Lisa to um, uh, run the Q&A. Thank you, Matthew. So the first question we have is for Yorma, um, which is what is the possibility of ever making a man-made black hole? OK, there's some serious research going uh, that has gone into this. In particular, uh, when the um, Large Hadron Collider got started in, in CERN for particle physics experiments, there were some alarmist reports, some fears that that might generate a black hole in a laboratory and we would all get uh, swallowed by that black hole. Um, a serious look has been taken into this. The chances are not good. We know of no way to create a black hole in uh, in the laboratory. It takes uh, it takes basically a star collapse to create a black hole. Okay. In a laboratory, um, ideas have been floated, but there's no serious mechanism for that. Thank you, Yama. So the next question is for our students. What is the social life like in maths? What activities are there at the university and what can you do in Nottingham? So I'm going to hand that over to Agnes, please. Um, so we do have a math society. Um, they run some math specific sports. I think there is like netball, maybe football. I'm not quite sure. Um, and there are also different schemes within the school. Um, we have a scheme called PASS, which is peer assisted study support, where first year students are put into groups of like 15 or 16. And then second and third year students supervise them in like almost revision sessions. Um, and it gives an opportunity for our like maths community to come together. And there is a lot of interaction between the different years. Um, and it's generally quite a nice and friendly atmosphere within the school. And Max, is there anything you'd like to add on to that? Uh, yeah, I'd say I always thought you have a really nice um, uh, undergraduate kind of study area, which you can see the main atrium of the maths building in. And it's, it's such a nice building. 
Uh, and I always thought it's great fun just to sit with people, you know, after lectures, between lectures or whatever, um, just talking about problem sheets or the various difficulties of studying maths. Thank you, Max. So the next question um, we've had submitted is aimed at Yorma. So is there a model which determines what size, shape or orientation an orbit should be dependent of the mass of a black hole and the star? Right. So uh, if the black hole, so if you have a star black hole pair, if they are far from each other, then old fashioned Newtonian mechanics, 300 years uh, of Newtonian mechanics is a pretty good approximation. You have basically an ellipse. Okay? If those things get closer to each other, then it's no longer quite an ellipse, but the ellipse starts precessing. Okay? Right? And you can see this in the solar system in the orbit of Mercury. Now, if the black holes, uh, if the black hole and neutron star get really close to each other, then the Einsteinian effects get serious. And uh, broadly speaking, the pair uh, gets closer and closer to each other. The orbital period gets shorter and shorter. And if you wait long enough, then you have a collision and a merger of those two. And uh, so that is what we have seen with these gravitational wave uh, observations in the sky. We've seen the gravitational waves that come from the collision, uh, the merger of two black holes or a black hole and a neutron star. OK, uh, and uh, collisions uh, and, and Yes, neutron star collisions as well, but for today it's black hole, so black hole mergers and black hole neutron star mergers. Thank you, Yorma. So the next question is for our students. Um, what do you wish you had known when you started university? What advice would you give to a new student? So I'll hand over to Max this time, please. Goodness. Um... One thing I wish I'd utilise more, say, is um, my personal tutor. I mean, in the second year and third year, um, having so I, I have a really great personal tutor and speaking to him more has been something I wish I did more from the outset. And um, but um, to be honest, I mean, you, you don't there's nothing you really need to know to uh, beforehand. You know, you turn up, everyone tells you what you need to do and um, just go to lectures and all that kind of stuff. And it's every, everything's there to help you. Um, Agnes, you got anything to add to that? Um, yeah, so I would say one piece of advice I'd give would be to get organised, get a planner, familiarise yourself with Google calendars, anything, because there's so much stuff that like going on at uni and there are so many things to keep track of. Um, so it's impossible to keep track of everything just in your head. So <laughs> I would suggest getting a planner. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Um, so our next question is aimed at Yorma, which is um, somebody's wrote gravitational waves. What is a distant change and how is one measured or calculated? OK, so the picture, okay, can I go back to, uh, if I go back on my overheads, does it show on your screen? I'm showing now a picture of that of those gravitational wave uh, of the gravitational wave observatory. Is it showing on your screen? It's on the screen, Yama. Yes, thank you. OK, so this is uh, in the American Midwest. So uh, we have here a vacuum tube. It's about three kilometers long going along the prairie. And there is a laser beam in that vacuum tube. It is being reflected many times back and forth. There's a big mirror at the other end over there. Then uh, there's another uh, vacuum tube here going to the left. The picture isn't enough to big enough to show where it is, but it's also about three kilometers long. And there's another uh, laser beam over there. And what you measure here is those small changes in distance of this, uh, this uh, vacuum tube and this vacuum tube. You measure it by in doing interferometry. Okay? So uh, looking at how those laser beams inside of those, uh, those uh, vacuum tubes interact. And by looking at that interferometry, you can find you can detect those very small changes in distance 
that the passing gravitational uh, wave uh, courses between this end and that end, uh, between this tube and that tube. Now, the real clincher is that this isn't a standalone piece of equipment. I mean, it's a big laboratory, uh, but it has a partner on the other side of the North American continent, a similar system. And then you compare the signal you see over here and in the partner system, and when you see the same signal in both of those laboratories, then you can be sure that it wasn't some local disturbance. It really was a gravitational wave that caused these changes of distances in these uh, tubes. Uh, now, uh, have I forgotten part of the question? Can you remind me? Um, so the question was, Yama, um, gravitational waves um, what is a distance change and how is one measured or calculated? Right, so I talked here about how it's measured. You've got a laser beam there, laser beam there. You look at the interference pattern over there. Um, okay, and uh, I think saying more would go uh, beyond my uh, personal expertise. I'm more of a black hole type person than a gravitational wave person. But I uh, refer, I can refer to the, um, uh, the website I mentioned here, ligo.caltech.edu, uh, that tells um, more about this subject. Thank you, Yama. Um, so the next question is aimed at our students, which is how is a maths degree different to A-level maths? So I'm going to ask Agnes that first, please. Um, so when you come into first year, the step up in terms of content isn't super steep, um, especially if you've done further maths, there will be a little bit of overlap. But I would say that um, a big difference is in the style of learning you're going to do um, because of how much more independent it is at university than um, in college. Um, but also in A-level maths, you're kind of still just learning the tools to do proper, ma proper maths, quote unquote. And then um, once you get to uni, you start learning the whole breadth and depth of mathematics. Thank you, Agnes. Max, have you got anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, all I can say really is I felt A-level maths was like a treadmill. You know, you couldn't, you know, you just couldn't really get off it. Whereas when you're um, studying with your degree, everything becomes a lot more about you and how you can, um, you know, you, you, it's about you learning things and um, I forgot the words. Um, but, you know, you can always, I just felt it was so much more um, laid back, say. So. Thank you, Max. So our next question is for Yama, which is in the sun Jupiter pair from the presentation, does the sun or Jupiter emit stronger gravitational waves? Ah, now that, that's a very perspicacious question. Where do, so you get when asked, where do the gravitational waves actually come from in this system? There's the sun and there's the Jupiter, and we usually think that the Jupiter moves a lot and the sun doesn't move a lot. Okay? You should really think of uh, this pair as the sun and the Jupiter uh, orbiting the, cent the common center of gravity. So the sun moves a little, Jupiter moves a lot, but they go around their, their own center of gravity. Uh, so, um, Okay, and now I am having a senior moment, as my American father-in-law used to say. I forget where I'm going with this question. Can, can you say uh, uh, again what the question was? Um, yes, Yona. So, in the Sun-Jupiter pair from the presentation, does the Sun or Jupiter emit stronger gravitational waves? Right. So, it's really this pair that emits those gravitational waves. It isn't an individual component there. It comes from this pair. So uh, if you look at this from far away, from someplace over there, you can tell that the system has 
emitted a gravitational wave. But if you look at the system from very close by, over here you can't really talk about the gravitational wave. The gravitational wave is a far field effect. It's a little bit the same thing about electromagnetic waves. It's what happens in the uh, antenna of your cell phone. When you wiggle the electrons in your cell phone antenna, uh, in that antenna, you, you don't really think of it as radio waves. You think of it as wiggling of electrons. And if you look right next to uh, the antenna, you still don't quite think of it as a wave. You just think that there's something wiggling in just your antenna. But if you look at what comes out from far away from your cell phone, then you can say, ah, this is really a radio wave. It's a similar story with this system. It's the system that creates those gravitational waves and you can interpret them as waves only when you look at it as far from the system. Thank you, Yama. So the next question is also for Yama, which is what is the difference between a black hole and a quantum black hole? Is it just smaller or does it have different properties? Right, so black holes is what we've been talking about here. Uh, they are astrophysical objects like, uh, let, let me put up the early picture. Right, so uh, there is a black hole at the center of, of our galaxy and we don't see it. Uh, what is it? And we can think of it as a pretty classical object. It's but if uh, you had a black hole with a smaller mass, uh, the mass of a mountain, say, then for those black holes, quantum effects would become more important. For these black holes at the centers of galaxies, the quantum effects are negligibly small, we believe. For black holes, the size of individual stars that might be created in a star collapse, for those quantum effects are negligibly small again. But if you somehow had a black hole that's the mass of a mountain, then we have reason to think that for those, quantum effects would be large. Uh, a key term here is something called Hawking radiation, which you might have heard about. These uh, stellar mass black holes don't emit very much Hawking radiation, but if you somehow found a, uh, uh, a mountain mass black hole, you, didn't, you wouldn't need to weigh it to see that there's something over there. You would see it emitting something called Hawking radiation. So in those quantum uh, black holes, the quantum effects would be important. Hawking uh, radiation is one example of those quantum effects. We have not yet seen uh, mountain mass black holes. Okay? So that gives us some cosmological estimates of how many there can at most be in the universe. Uh, but it is a respectable idea in cosmology that there might be some floating around and there are serious searches for these uh, mountain mass uh, black holes out there. We haven't seen any, uh, but there might be some and if somebody goes and finds a mountain mass black hole that emits Hawking radiation, that is a heavy contender for the next year's Nobel Prize. Thank you, Yama. So our next question um, also for Yama is, do you think that we will ever observe a wormhole in real life? I'm not a betting man, okay? Uh, it, so, uh, well, Einstein's theory is a good theory, and based on Einstein's theory, we can uh, calculate what sort of energies it would require to keep a wormhole open. They are humongous energy densities uh, that we need. Um, we've got really no conceivable technology as, as known at present that could produce such energy densities. So I'm, I'm personally not optimistic, okay? Uh, but, well, who knows? Uh, maybe one of you is giving a talk like this in 30 years time and will be able to answer that question. Thank you, Yama. Um, so the next question for Yama is, what is the difference between general and special relativity? 
Okay, general relativity means gravity. Special relativity means no significant gravity. Velocities may be large, may be close to the speed of light, but gravitational effects negligible. So special means no gravity, general means yes gravity. Thank you, Yama. So um, our next question is aimed at the students. So what are the benefits you've found to studying maths at university? So I'll hand that over to Max first, please. Benefits, I mean, I just feel it's given me um, a lot of confidence in just learning anything, like approaching a new uh, problem, say in, um, well, confidently. So, um, you know, I've, you know, language, I quite enjoy reading bits of, a little bits about languages and things. I find it's just applied in those um, ways and give me confidence to just learn things from first principles, say. Um, I mean, of course, there's the obvious benefit of, you know, studying maths and getting all the nice school physics-y things that we all love. But, um, but I mean, you know, apart from the non-obvious ones, you know, I think that's what it, yeah. Uh, thank you, Max. Agnes, have you got anything to add to that? Um, I think it's a difficult question to answer, but I would say just like the strengthening your problem skills, um, being able to provide quite a unique point of view in like interdisciplinary um, conversations. Um, I think, I don't know, I think there's so many benefits, but it's difficult to think of one off the top of my head. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. Um, so this next question, I think I'll hand over to Matthew, um, which is what other areas of maths is it possible to specialise in at Nottingham? Um, OK, thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously beyond the mathematical physics, which Jorma has been talking about, um, there are a variety of different areas. We've got a very strong group in statistics and probability. Um, so, and then in particular, are looking at things like uh, epidemiology at the moment, which again links with a group that we have in mathematical medicine and biology. So again, that, that epidemiology, um, cancer growth and treatment, all sorts of things like that. My particular area is scientific computation, which is translating mathematical equations into a form where you can do realistic uh, computational simulations, which might be cancer growth, which is one of the things I work in, weather prediction is another thing, all sorts of things like that, which again links in with our applied mathematics groups, which um, go into fluid dynamics and also into waves, either fluid waves or electromagnetic waves. And then we've got a whole load of areas in pure mathematics, more in algebra and analysis um, and number theory and uh, geometry where we have expertise there. Um, the best place to look is on our research web pages. So if you go to our school web pages and look at the research pages, you'll find out more there. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so our next question is for Yama, which is why does the movement of mass cause gravitational waves? Short answer. It's a prediction of Einstein's equations. So, uh, right. Let's think about uh, electricity and magnetism. So the equations that Maxwell, uh, one of the persons in our picture gallery, uh, the, the equations that Maxwell uh, wrote down 150 years ago. So uh, we uh, knew about electricity and we knew about magnetism, OK? But Maxwell put these things together and he predicted that there's something called radio waves, OK? And uh, you create those uh, radio waves by moving electrons, moving charges around. That was a prediction of his equations. Okay? And sure enough, these radio waves were then discovered. Okay? We learned to generate them. And in fact, we understood that light itself is just part of this same electromagnetic radiation spectrum. Well, uh, something similar happened with Einstein. I mean, we didn't know about gravitational waves before Einstein wrote down his equations, but he discovered that part of that, uh, once he wrote down his uh, equations, part of the prediction was that you can generate gravitational waves by moving mass around. Okay? 
We didn't know about that until Einstein wrote, those, his, uh, wrote down his equations, but it was a prediction of those equations. And then it took 100 years before we actually saw those gravitational waves in a hands-on or laboratory-on experiment. Thank you, Yama. So our next question is about um, A-level further maths. The first question is, do you need to have A-level further maths? And if you don't have A-level further maths, is there any support available um, to help you? So I'm going to first hand that over to Agnes, please. Um, so if you have an further maths, it doesn't really put you at a disadvantage. There is quite a good portion of students that come in without having done further maths. Um, in first year, a lot of the content that you would learn would be kind of getting everybody up to the same speed. But if you feel that that's not enough or that it's going too fast, um, there are also um, support sessions for students that haven't done further maths that go more in depth about the topics. Um, and regardless of whether you've done further maths or not, there is a lot of support for students um, if you're struggling both in terms of like pastoral support and in, in terms of academics. Um, so you have your personal tutor to help with your academic support. Um, you have um, pa the PASS scheme, which I mentioned earlier, where you have second and third year students um, kind of there to help you settle in and be a friendly face in the crowd. Um, we also have a new study buddy scheme where you can be matched up with students that do similar modules. Um, so you have somebody um, to kind of motivate each other when you're studying. Um, I don't know, does Max want to add anything? Yes, no, you really do not need further maths at all. I didn't have further maths um, when I came to Nottingham. And um, I've, you know, gone, I've, the master's course I'm going to is the one, you know, it's my first choice and um, all those things. So you do not need further maths at all. And of course, if you, you know, if you find that transition difficult, I mean, um, you have your personal tutor, as I said earlier, um, who will just help you with everything. And I mean, the lecturers are so approachable. I mean, if you come here, I think Yorma will teach you in first year calculus. And uh, yeah, he's very, very good. So uh, you have all these supports around you um, and but you don't need it anyway. I mean, like I couldn't, I didn't know what a complex number was before I came to Nottingham or I had very little intuition and I've taken um, pretty much all the applied modules you've seen there except for QFT. So you do not need um, further maths at all, but there is help if you need it. Thank you, Max. Um, so our next question is for Yama. So how come every galaxy has a black hole and why are these at the centre of them? Excellent question. Open research problem. Chicken and egg problem. Which was first? Uh, was the black hole there in some nascent form first and then the galaxy formed around it? Or did the galaxy form first and then somehow a gravitational collapse took place and uh, created the black hole at the center of the galaxy? We don't know. This is an open research problem. Thank you, Yama. So the next question is also for Yama. Um, will it be possible to use the energy given off by gravitational waves? Uh, given that it's taken about 100 years to, take, uh, to develop the technology, even to measure them in the first place, um, to use them for something is... is um, uh, OK, let, let, let me look, in a slight, look at this question in a slightly different way. We are already using gravitational waves for something. We are using them for finding out about our own universe. OK, so uh, let me take an example. The first uh, observed uh, uh, collision of two black holes, the first observed collision by these gravitational waves. They were black holes that were, uh, I forget now, 20 or 30 solar masses each. And it was surprised that these big, uh, these 20, 30 solar mass uh, black holes even exist in the sky. We didn't think that there were all that many of them. And the very first observation was of such uh, 20, 30 uh, solar mass black holes. And in the observations we've made since then in the past 
five or six years, we've seen many more black holes of a similar mass. So we've, uh, we now know that there's a big population of certain types of uh, black holes there that we didn't know about uh, in, uh, in the universe. So we've already learned something about our own universe by, uh, from the gravitational wave observations that we've seen. It's an instrument for looking at the sky. It's an instrument for finding out about our own universe. Could you do something more sort of laboratory hands on useful with it? I mean, it takes black holes to collide to generate significant amounts of gravitational waves. What use might you have for this technology? Uh, well, I have no guesses at this point, but well, who knows how it looks like in 30 years time when perhaps one of you will be giving uh, uh, a math maths masterclass talk like this. Thank you, Yama. Um, we've got time for a few more questions, just a little bit more time. Um, so I'm going to ask a question to the students. Um, there's two similar questions. One of them is why maths? And the other question was what made you pick a maths degree? So Max, I don't know if you want to answer that first, please. Sure, well, I got, I got into maths in the kind of the complete wrong way. So originally I applied to do physics and then during the waiting period between results day for A level and um, and when I applied, I changed to mathematical physics and then I changed to maths at the end of the first year. So I've traveled the spectrum. But for me, it was just um, I've, I've always been very interested in physics and Nottingham Maths offers some pretty awesome courses. So um, I slowly changed there after realizing that um, I much I feel it's an oversimplification, say, but I feel like if you have one problem, physics kind of comes, say, from the bottom down, whereas math builds you up and talks about I, I, just, I just much preferred the way maths taught things, um, so it drew me uh, all the way over there. Um, so yeah, and I do not regret it at all. Um, Thank you, Max. Um, Agnes, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, so I, I only really started thinking about math seriously during A-levels. Um, before that, I really wanted to be a graphic designer. Um, but kind of, I, I think that I think that I I made the right decision coming to study maths and just finding out about all the different things that are out there and just really like the the breadth of topics that um, you can do and you, the, the the different things you can actually apply maths to. Um, I just yeah I just think it's really cool. I like the I like the moment where you finally figure it out and there's like a like a light bulb that lights up above your head. Um, I think that's why I picked maths. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. So I think we have time for probably one more question. Um, so to Yama, when two black holes merge, do they form a supermassive black hole? Depends on how large they were, how massive they were to begin with. So if two black holes merge, uh, the mass of the black hole that ensues, it's comparable to the masses of the individual black holes, but slightly less. Okay? And the reason why it's slightly less is that E equals mc squared, mass equals energy, and when those black holes collide, they send out energy in terms of gravitational waves, the gravitational waves that we have seen. And because of this, uh, the mass of the black hole that ensues is slightly less than the sum of the masses of the individual black holes. Black hole is, it depends on how big those individual solar, uh, individual uh, masses were, but it's slightly less. Thank you, Yana. Um, so, yes, thank you for attending today's masterclass. In due course, the videos of today's talks and slides with all the links will be sent to all those who have booked for this masterclass. Thank you for attending today and thank you to our speakers and the student ambassadors. Um, goodbye. <laughs>